Welcome to the Gems of Motherhood. I'm your host, Sharon Khan. I'm here to connect you with some amazing gems of mothers from all walks of life. Each week, you'll hear interviews as well as resources and actionable tips that you can implement in your daily life to be the best gem God has called you to be. Thanks for walking this journey with me today. And don't forget to subscribe to the show. Now let's get into episode 19 with Mo Isom Aiken. We can begin too to just share with our children in this really reverent, beautiful heart mm-hmm. posture, the sanctity of their lives, of their bodies, of what God has designed. You know, the world right now is just so carnal. Well, this is a subject matter that we don't often uh, address, especially in the Christian world. Now, it's like a missing piece, especially for young kids. And it's probably a very uncomfortable subject for parents too. Today, we have Mo Isom Aiken, who will be chatting with us about talking about sex with our children. Now, Mo Isom Aiken is a New York Times bestselling author, a nationally sought after speaker, and a powerful voice rising up for her next generation. Her life was riddled with great personal tragedy, including battling an eating disorder, overcoming the suicide of her father, struggling with promiscuity and surviving a horrific car accident. By the grace of God alone, she encountered the love and mercy of Jesus. Her two books, Wreck My Life, Journeying from Broken to Bold, and Sex, Jesus, and the Conversations the Church Forgot have reached tens and thousands of people worldwide, and her messages of hope, transformation, and timely Holy Spirit-led revelation have been featured on countless other platforms. Welcome to the Gems of Motherhood podcast, Mo. It's so good to have you on the show. Thank you so much. It is a joy to join you. I, I appreciate you opening up the conversation. Yes, absolutely. I I know you have a story to tell all the moms out there. You've got several stories, but to sum it up, could you just share a little bit about your story? Sure. Yes. I was raised um, in the Christian home. I, I grew up in the Bible Belt. I grew up with wonderful, God-fearing parents. Um, but sort of knew a lot about God, didn't really personally know God, um, mm. did the right things, you know, showed up. It was sort of this faith by inheritance, I guess. I'm a Christian because my parents are Christians. And uh, as I began to, you know, develop and mature and transition through life, that uh, was weak weak sand versus a rock to be standing on. And I uh, started to encounter a lot of adversity in my younger years from identity issues to eating disorder to self-harm, to the suicide of my father unexpectedly catapulted me into depression, anxiety, promiscuity, um, just really, really went through it. (laughs) At the same time, was a very successful athlete on the surface and playing uh, collegiate soccer and traveling the world. And so could kind of hide, hide behind my, um, you know, successful things that people saw and praised, but ultimately was really hurting Mm -hmm. and, could talk the talk, but didn't really know how this Christ, this blood, this grace, this mercy applied to my life changed things until I was headed home in college for for a Thanksgiving break and lost control of my car on an interstate. Really at the end of my rope at that time, I was Mm -hmm. very depressed, very anxious, broken, um, just wearing so many different masks, just tired. Right. And, um, I actually lost control of my car on the interstate and flipped it several times and oh, wow. uh, landed in a ravine at 1.30 in the morning. And it was there in the midst of that wreckage that the spirit of the living God just entered right into quite literally my mess, mm. <laughs> the disaster, the wreckage that my life had really become yeah. um, and absolutely captured my heart mm. and just transformed my life. And this gospel I'd heard so many times but it had been in in the ear, out the other, you know, or I understood bits and pieces of, or I could understand by the flesh. Suddenly, my spirit actually came to life. Mm. Um, he breathed new life into who I was as he made me to be. And the trajectory of my life just completely shifted after receiving Christ there, uh, which certainly didn't mean no more valleys or challenges, but... Right. Um, there was divine hope in the midst of it all and, and led by the Holy spirit and transformed by the love of Jesus. And, um, 
a lot of healing took place, a lot of transformation, uh, a lot of revelation as mm-hmm. I healed on so many different topics, especially what we'll dig into of just yeah. sex and sexuality and our bodies and uh, eventually met my husband and we are coming up next weekend on six years of marriage. Yay, and, um, happy anniversary. Have, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's so fun. It's been life, you know, through a fire hose. We have three kids to show for it and a fourth on the way and just yeah, yeah. a lot of joy and excitement. And yeah, it, is, it has been a great journey. I've, I've gotten to write some books and travel and share testimony and teach the word of God and just testify. And it's been the greatest adventure, just following Christ yes. and realizing his full redemption over, over my life and allowing it to transform all of what life looks like moving forward, you know, into motherhood, into marriage, into mm-hmm. um, every different season, knowing what never changes nor fails, who is with us and for us. And um, it's been a, a great adventure. And continues yeah. to be. Amen. Well, God is good. Um, I kind of want to jump into our subject matter that we're about to talk about because it's something that we hardly address it. I, I don't really hear much about it. Teaching and talking to your children about sex. It's such a big word, right, when we talk about sex. So right. I guess I wanted to ask you, how do we equip our children with a comprehensive view with the issue of sex? Yeah, it's a great question. I could talk the whole <laughs> hour even just addressing this first one. Um, you know, there are a few different pieces to this puzzle, I believe, that um, I've learned and grown in and am experiencing in uh, the most beautiful ways as God kind of walks me through it. But You know, the first piece is that we as women, we as mothers, Mm -hmm. uh, we as daughters of the Most High King um, must allow him to minister to, to heal and to uh, cultivate this conversation with us within Mm. our own hearts first. Mm. I find a lot of times people are very intimidated or confused or scared, honestly, Mm -hmm. to navigate the conversation of of sex with their children because uh, really they don't even realize that that conversation is one that the Lord wants to have with them too first. Right. It's um, important. You know, it's really important. Many of us have baggage. Many of us have backstories. Many of us uh, have learned things the hard way or were abused or um, carry shame. Mm-hmm. Really. And I think, you know, the first and most important piece in learning how to sort of comprehensively walk with our children through this is allowing the Lord to comprehensively walk with us mm. uh, through our own understanding. I mean, the fact alone that sex is a, is an invention of God's, that mm-hmm. it is a gift from God actually in the right context, that it is uh, an act of worship really in the right context, that it's a weapon against the enemy in the right context. All of these things seem very disorienting, even with that type of language around it, even to someone who is in um, you know, a, a healthy marriage with a, a healthy sex life. We just, these worlds haven't collided much in conversation. But man, his text is full of this truth. Uh, from Genesis to Revelation, he uses imagery around this subject. He gives us instruction. He weaves the truth of our identity through his word. Mm-hmm. And uh, really, narratives of sex and sexuality and brokenness and then how it is rightly carried out, they, They weave all through the word. So I would say, uh, first and foremost, it begins with allowing God to sort of comprehensively minister to our own hearts. Mm -hmm. And when, when we allow him to do that, the freedom that comes, the healing that comes, and the right-natured understanding of how to appropriately carry out these conversations rooted in the Word of God, you know, and not be gratuitous or 
you know, compromise with the culture and just sound like the world, like all of this understanding comes for us uh, to minister to our children when Mm -hmm. he's first ministered it to us. Mm -hmm. So that's really where I believe it begins. And we can see a lot of fruit come when, when our starting place is there. Right. And I think when there's, um, when we acknowledge our own healing and, you know, like you said, healing and cultivating the conversation, um, there's so much more freedom and uh, so much more heart and love from God that you're able to share about the message itself, right? And right, so, exactly. Yeah, so, you know, why is it important for us moms to even have that conversation with our children? Yeah, I, I love this question because so <laughs> many ask it. I, I've heard from so many women a lot of different questions. And, you know, some are, when do I have the this conversation? How do I have, who else can have this for me? <laughs> so I don't have to, like, you know, a lot of actually my sexual struggles came from, I think my parents assuming the church was having this type of conversation with me, the church assuming the parents were, right. and really no one was. So my, you know, view was framed by uh, a pretty broken culture. Mm. Um, but I think often of um, the scripture that speaks to us about um, teaching our children of the ways of the Lord when we rise, as mm. we are going and as we are coming, that, that would always be on our lips, that it would always be in conversation. And this is just an area, sex and, and sexuality and all of the topics that fall under this, mm-hmm. they so deeply root to our identity. Mm-hmm. And so I, we think this is taboo. We've bought into the you know narrative that this is taboo or uncomfortable. Right. Uh, isn't usually rooted from a healthy, godly place. It's rooted from how the world has framed it. Right. But just like as I teach my children about the faith, as I teach my children about you know God the Father, Christ the Son, the Holy Spirit. I do it in a conversational manner, starting from the youngest age possible. Mm -hmm. And I continue to build on those foundational blocks and, you know, cultivate even just speaking of the faith. And so why would we not do the same when speaking to them about their identity, when speaking to them about sex, when speaking to them about such a paramount thing, um, it, it needs to begin as early as God graces us with the, with the courage, the ability, the, you know, um, the push to do so, no matter if someone's listening, their child is 10 or, you know, 15 or two, like it, his mercies are new every morning. And I believe he desires that we, uh, it's actually our mandate as Mm -hmm. parents to be leading our children in the way that they should go, to be speaking of his ways and his decrees and God's heart uh, conversationally from the beginning, building upon that and guiding them in truth. And so I I, I just find that it is actually kind of a non-negotiable it's, yeah. it's expected from the heart of the father that we would be ministering to our children about right. this and cultivating this conversation. Yeah. And I think there's so much power in it too, you know, um, power in the sense as in coming from a Christ-centered view right. of what sex truly means. And it's better for our children to learn it from our home, our Christian right. home, rather than getting the worldview of what sex truly means to them. And right. like you said, you, you right. can easily get lost in your identity if that's the narrative that you're buying into. And obviously as parents, that's part of our responsibility in you know sharing our faith, but as well as sharing about why God created sex and sexuality to our children. And Mm -hmm. I I think that is powerful because especially in today's world where the enemy tries to destroy Mm -hmm. uh, the Christian family and Christian children uh, in so many different thoughts or, you know, different worldviews coming in about identity, gender confusion, and etc. And so this is such an important thing for for children to learn uh, from their parents. Right. And so, you know, there's never probably a good time, but how do you know when is a good time to talk about sex with your children? And yeah, when is a, a good, good age? <laughs> <laughs> well, that uh, comes with a little bit of a story as well, how the Lord began to talk to me and teach me about this. You know, uh, 
idea that was very culturally formed of the talk of this one time father sits down his 16 year old son and they have the talk, you know, and the, the sort of concept that we've, it's been, you know, displayed by movies um, and it's been expressed as an awkward sort of taboo weird thing. But the reality is that um, this is foolish. <laughs> Because first and foremost, um, our, our children are being exposed to things at younger and younger and younger ages. Mm -hmm. I believe right now the average age of exposure to pornography is nine years old. That's yeah. the average. That means there are many children who are much school bus. This is, you know, anywhere and everywhere. I was exposed at nine before there were even mobile devices. I mean, I mm -hmm. was, you know, just exposed from my dad's own stuff and a neighbor, older neighbor. And uh, it's just younger and younger that the enemy is on mission and seeking mm. to infiltrate, to pervert, to just wound the minds and the hearts of young people um, and to distort this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I remember, um, goodness, when my first daughter uh, was only about, she wasn't even two years old yet. Um, my We lived in a townhouse at the time and in the master bathroom, the shower was glass. It was you know, see through. And you know, there is no privacy when you have toddlers. It is not like you say, excuse me, please wait outside while oh, I yeah. am doing things. So totally. I remember one day, um, my husband was in the shower and my daughter toddled in. And um, for whatever reason that day, she took just this vested interest in my husband. She could see him through the shower and he's trying to be very discreet and turn away. And I'm kind of turning and seeing what's happening. And it was like the Holy Spirit stopped me in that moment and said, there's one of two responses you can have here. You can freak out. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't look, don't look, that, 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 you know, come on, come away. And you will instill in your child almost a shock and shame reaction mm -hmm. or you can guide her away and guide her to me. And I just thought she's one and a half. She's not even two. What is it? What do you mean? But I pressed in and um, I just sort of, you know, diverted my daughter. And I remember just asking Holy Spirit, please give me the words to say right now. I was not even anticipating navigating conversation around any of this. And it was so simple. The building block conversation that the Lord gave, I simply said, wow, isn't it interesting? Um, that daddy is so different. He's a boy. God right. designed him this way. And we're girls. You're just like mommy. God designed us this way and moved on, you know, and it right. was just this very simple moment that I realized I can run from this or just, you know, push past the whole moment, or I can begin right now, as I said before, even as we walk our children in the foundations of the faith as a whole, I can begin right now with the most elementary building blocks. And it, it begins around our identity. It begins around our maker who right. made us Amen. wonderfully, you know, and then it grows and progresses as they do. And I just really, I thanked God after that moment for stopping me in that and causing me to care in that mm -hmm. moment. And I've thanked him every day moving forward that as um, my children have grown, when they've come with questions or when things have happened, they have known, even still at young ages, it's a safe place they can come to mommy and daddy to ask questions, to navigate the conversation. Our job as mothers, as, you know, parents of these children is ultimately to lead them and to teach them in truth because we're not always going to be there. And, you know, I see a lot of parents kind of approach it of like, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to put the thought in their mind. We don't want to make them wonder. And I'm like, the thought's already coming in their mind. They're already yeah. being exposed to things. And so we have this ability to not be fearful of it, but to in faith walk with the Lord in cultivating rightly these conversations. Because one day when I'm not there, mm -hmm. I want my... I, I pray the Holy Spirit will speak to and convict and teach my children that mm -hmm. they would be the ones who have enough of a knowledge base when, you know, they're possibly exposed to pornography or see right. something on TV, they would know, hey, that's an image bearing creation of God. Why would I want to 
see them right. doing that or, you know, objectify them in that way. And obviously that's down the line for us a bit, but yeah, that's the long goal. You know, this yeah. is a long arc game yeah. and it's just so important. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think that sometimes we underestimate how much children learn and how much they understand, uh, yes. even at a very young age. My daughter right. is two and a half years old and she knows mm. clearly that, you know, daddy is a boy and mommy is a girl. And we try to tell her that this is how God created us to be different. Um, Daddy is a boy and you are a girl and Mm -hmm. you are fearfully and wonderfully made in him. And uh, and so oftentimes, uh, I I feel like you said in the beginning, uh, we shy away because of the narrative of what the world has created. And But no, we have to take that power back because God has given us the power to share to our children. And so I know you kind of shared some of the basic lessons, you know, where the Holy Mm -hmm. Spirit just led you to talk to your child and kind of share about how God created different sex. And I guess I wanted to ask, how else can we communicate the function and purpose of sex with our children? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Again, it continues to come as we continue to fully learn and see the fullness of Mm -hmm. God's intent and his design for this. There's so much depth. He's even teaching me now as a 31-year-old woman about how he created sex as this beautiful gift between a husband and a wife Mm -hmm. and how that prophesies this beautiful intimacy that we're invited into between he as the bridegroom and we as his bride, this Mm -hmm. consecrating love, this transformational love. And to some people that would seem so disorienting, but when you really begin to press in to the heart of God and ask him to show you what you've given us is mm-hmm. is deeply spiritual as well. And it is framing for us the understanding of our ability in covenantial marriage, love with you, Lord, to draw near to you, that you draw near to us, that we come with our mess and our bumps and our stretch marks and our Bars and still mm-hmm. you delight in us that we, you know, work out our salvation with fear and trembling, like that you, your love transforms us. It's so incredible. Yeah. And so as we begin to see that more clearly, even of what uh, the physical act is meant to show us um, of God's heart, of his nature, uh, we can begin to, to just share with our children in this really reverent, beautiful heart Mm -hmm. posture, the sanctity of their lives, of their bodies, of what God has designed. You know, the world right now is just so carnal in all ways that it approaches sex, sexuality. There is messaging changing every day. It's all relative. It's very very physical, very carnal only. I think we have this incredible invitation to out of our odd heart posture, share with our children the truth of, Mm -hmm. hey, this is bigger. This is actually much bigger Mm -hmm. than just a physical act. And God has given us these boundaries and this design for our good. He is protecting us and he is guiding us in the way that we should go. And, you know, I think a lot of times kids, young adults, I mean, myself included growing up, we almost get this really confusing message from the church in that we hear sex is bad. It's gross. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Like avoid, 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 and then suddenly get married and it's great. And it creates this strange approach to it of like denial, 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 then I'm supposed to flip a switch and it all be fine. (laughs) And uh, I I mean, I wrote a whole chapter in my book called The Honeymoon Hardship of how I was just grieved on my honeymoon. I didn't understand how to just shift gears like that. And I I brought baggage with me to the altar and right into Mm. the marriage, you know. Mm -mm -mm. Um, I think the challenge is and the invitation is we as believers can really change the narrative of this for our children. Instead of, you know, propagating this message of it's bad, it's bad, don't do it, deny to actually teach the truth. This is a good gift. Mm -hmm. And this has boundaries and this has parameters, um, but it's for your good and your protection. 
and baby girl, this is what I would say to my children. Like the world is going to tell you a very different message that this is uh, perverse, that this is casual, that this is just physical. There's no emotion. There's no, Mm -hmm. you know, it's your body, your terms, when you want it. And this is a lie. We Mm -hmm. must know this is a good thing, but this gift has a time and a place. And um, just guiding them in the full direction of, of that truth. You know, I, I think too, to the mothers of young ones, like, uh, you know, my, you and myself, and I, I think too, how I even rightly cultivate that there's a lot too, to be said about a child seeing their parents living this truth as well. Right now, not perverse, not (laughs) climbing all over each other in front of the kids, but truly godly affection, um, tenderness with between the husband and a wife, the hand holding. I can look back even to my childhood and clearly remember moments. I simply saw my parents holding hands Mm -hmm. and I thought it was so beautiful. But to truly model for our children how to honor intimacy Mm -hmm. at all stages, I think teaches them so much too. And, you know, create space that then when they would see something in the world, they would say, wait, that looks really different than what I know of my family and my home. And I kind of like their way better. You know, it seems more sure. And, you know, as you were talking, it just kind of reminds me of purity. You know, there right. there is such a pureness in God's love. When we love the way God loves, it's so different when it, it is a carnal love. Right. I mean, I had my own share of promiscuity and we, I, I think we both can testify that there is such a difference when Christ is in it and when Christ is not in it. And so do you think that sex and purity go hand in hand? And, and, and if so, how do you explain that to our children? Because I mean, like you said, you know, sometimes it's us modeling, holding hands and not being overboard and being on top of each other or anything. Right. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I'd love to just hear it from you. Of course. Yeah. You know, I'm in the generation that peers my age and and some a bit older really got scorned by what they would call the purity culture, the move of the purity ring, the, you know, I kiss dating goodbye. I hear that referenced a lot, just Mm -hmm. sort of this purity culture. It wasn't the fullness unpacked. And so it carried a lot of shame. It carried uh, guilt. I, I didn't as much follow that, but I did have, um, goodness, I remember at nine years old, going down to my mom's bedroom and asking her a few questions about the science project I was doing. And uh, it was on snakes. And I was trying to figure out how snakes had sex. And, uh, we didn't have like internet where you could just search. So I'm like, mom, be my encyclopedia. And it launched us into kind of more conversation. Um, and I remember, uh, she started to tell me, I'm sure she was like worried and nervous at some of the terms I was using. Cause I'd already been exposed to so much, but she started to speak to me about virginity mm-hmm. and I cut her off almost in the middle of what she was saying. Cause she shared, you know, God desires that we be virgins and your father was a virgin when he married me and I was a virgin and I triumphantly stood up and made my vain virginity vow, then mother, I too will be a virgin when I get married. And I just marched out of the room. And I remember so young, but I specifically remember thinking that was the answer. Mm -hmm. That's what God wanted. He just wanted me to be a virgin. Mm -hmm. And so I would be a virgin and that's not all wrong, but it's also not all of it. Right. Uh, And so um, it led me to that question that I think far too many believers uh, get stuck on of like, okay, then like how far is too far? Mm-hmm. And we live in this gray area of like, basically how much can I get away with and still be a virgin? And the problem with even the conversation solely being trailed down the virginity path is I did not know about purity, mm-hmm. what God actually calls in the fullness of our purity, that we would be of pure hearts that we would be of pure minds, Mm -hmm. that our words we speak would be pure, that our actions would be pure. And virginity is going to be a beautiful byproduct of that. But if we just look to sort of the works-based thing of virginity and we miss the heart transformational call to purity, Mm -hmm. and uh, we end up scorned in that weird 
culture of like making these vows, but then living very different lives kind of in the darkness or wondering how far can we go or goodness, so many losing their virginity and feeling like I'm worthless to God now. There's right. no, there's no going right. back. What's the point? You know, I couldn't do it. I didn't do it. And forgetting to the blood and the receptor purifies our hearts mm-hmm. again. And his, his greatest call mm-hmm. is to purity. And I think um, you can be a virgin and completely impure. That was my story. I'm addicted to porn. I'm pushing an envelope right. behind closed doors. I'm claiming virginity, but my heart is impure. And it's a red flag I see. I want to just wave in the church. Like the conversation is bigger. It always is deeper and it mm. always is about uh it centers around create in me a clean heart oh god mm-hmm. renew a steadfast spirit within me the purity of one's heart is the ultimate goal of the gospel mm-hmm. and so we can't have a conversation of sex without seeing virginity and running bases and how far is too far and missing the why oh the Lord wants the wholeness of my life. Mm-hmm. And um, he wants the fullness of our, our children's lives and hearts and words and actions as well. Uh, but the, the two conversations go hand in hand. They really can't be separated because uh, purity is the driving why right. behind even honoring God's way of sexuality. And I mean, as we're talking about purity, many times, especially in today's society, in today's culture, children face social pressure about sex, false Mm. expectations, temptations, and everything that the society are talking about, you know, different different sexuality and et cetera. How can we help our children not to be intimidated by those pressure? Right. Right. Great question. I truly believe now my children aren't yet the age of being out in the culture to that degree. They're still younger. And so um, they're truly, I believe there's so much wisdom and um, seeking if, if women listening have uh, women in their lives who are mothers to older children and they see the good fruit of that motherhood and those older children who have walked in the ways of the Lord or, you know, been redeemed and transformed or whatever it may be. There's so much, I go oftentimes to women of older their children to, to seek help in this area. But I do think, again, it goes back to cultivating the conversation from a very young age, being open ears, an open receptive source to hear and receive their questions, always pointing them to the word of truth mm-hmm. in your answers, always celebrating and speaking truth of their God-given identity. And also, um, this is a really big one I see, speaking and celebrating truth of the opposite sex's God-given identity. Mm. And so the uniqueness and the beauty made, you know, men made boy, all the characteristics that that, you know, carries and God's call for the young men, as well as the uniqueness, the beauty and wonder of the, their identity as women and all that God, you know, um, has blessed in that nature and calls young women to. And I think sometimes a lot of what I see, especially culturally in a lot of the gender confusion and the identity mm-hmm. issues and this hyper feminism move is it's just at a complete squashing of the other sexes ability. We see it also in misogyny. It's a complete squashing at like the opposite sex's ability or giftings or um, strength or call to carry out what God has knit and woven into them. And so rather than building up our brothers and sisters in faith, Mm -hmm. we tear down the other or we think we we're meant to do all things and can be both can you know right. we get so confused on what the roles and the identities are of the women of God and the men of God and it it lands us in a lot of weird middle mucky ground um, that can be super confusing for young people so again I think it goes to affirming and speaking truth over their identity I also um, I know this kind of stretches it wider as well but I. I want to emphasize, I think it goes in confirming and speaking truth over their word-breathed identity. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times we 
limit actually and take our social construct of what we've perceived for a young woman right. and fail to celebrate the fullness of how you are fully woman made in the image of God. But maybe, I mean, I think of myself, I was, a, I was athletic. I was a competitor. I was physically very strong. Mm-hmm. I was built very strong. I mean, I'm six foot one. I stuck out like a sore thumb and hearing, having women around me growing up saying you are all of these things. And that's amazing because you are a woman and God made you this way. Mm. And it may look different than the other, you know, your sister who's five foot two and brains and much more maybe delicate in nature, but you are both unique, wonderful, you know, crafted. And we look to women in the scriptures like Deborah, who's like this 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 lady to the Esters, to these (laughs) women who showed such strength as well as looking to the women who carried these nurturing hearts and were, um, you know, maybe different in, in missional call or assignment from the Lord as others. And so celebrating the fullness of womanhood too, and what that looks like. Cause so many now, I mean, I see young peers, young athletes, especially Mm -hmm. this grip of gender confusion Mm -hmm. of, of gender identity issues grab them because they don't look they don't want to do their makeup. They don't want to right. do their hair. They they want to hide their big, strong muscles because it's masculine, you know, right? all of these things. So I just think in the big picture, it is about looking to the fullness of the men and the women of the word, unpacking the fullness of who God made us to be and encouraging our children forward in truth, in truth, Amen. in truth, and um, guiding them in, in, you know, the way that, that they are to go, but also celebrating uniquely who God made them to be. Because God, God's not making the errors. It's usually right, us exactly. confused about how that looks. And God's words yeah. is so, just so simple, right? Only we right. complicated. And, <laughs> and right, so exactly. Um, we're almost at the end of the show, but is there anything else that you would like to share with the other gems of mothers out there? Oh, I would just love to encourage every woman listening, every mother listening. um, His mercies are new every morning. Amen. He is with us. I I think so often, at least as I frame, you know, my understanding of the Lord, of um, God the Father, our Abba Mm. Father, as these beautiful fatherly roles, as Christ the Son, the firstborn of many brethren, as our friend, as our, um, you know, older brother as our leader. And I so often in my mind frame Holy Spirit as um, the the more feminine maternal characteristics of God, Holy Spirit, counselor, teacher, convictor, helper. And I just think it's the most incredible invitation that we have as women and as mothers to um, portray really the heart of God to our children and the way that we counsel them and lead them and teach them and point out, you know, the, the errors as well. And, you know, serve as their guide, uh, as they, you know, walk in the ways of the Lord, but it's such an incredible invitation and it's also so hard. Yeah, it <laughs> it's is. It's so, so hard to be so human and, you know, it, it truly be upon us us as the ones stewarding these lives yeah. um, to walk with them in truth. We're imperfect and we're all learning, but I just want to encourage every single mother listening. You're doing an incredible job. Yeah. Continue to press into the heart of the Lord. He will give wisdom. He will give knowledge, understanding. And I truly believe his grace is sufficient for us as we walk forward and um, seek to show the heart of the Lord to our children. So mm-hmm. just cheering all the moms on out there. It's a lot. But we can <laughs> it do is it. a lot. We can do it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Mo. I just really felt in my heart that we just need to pray right now. Um, and yeah. if you don't mind, would you mind closing us in prayer? Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. Heavenly Father, Abba Father, we just praise you. We praise you. We thank you, Lord, uh, for your great love that you would send your son to die for us, to atone for our sins that we could be forgiven as well as that you would send your Holy Spirit to write your laws on our heart, your ways within us, God, the spirit given to us to lead us and teach us uh, and, and convict us and guide us. We just thank you for your mercy, for your grace and for your love. Heavenly Father, we just come in intercession over the next generation. I just come in intercession over the children of every single mother listening. Lord, would you bless 
bless and equip and strengthen and empower every single mother and even father who's tuned into this word. Lord, would you pour out your Holy Spirit to give them greater wisdom, greater understanding, healing in their own hearts, uh, right-natured understanding of you, of sex, of sexuality, of, of this gift you have given us so that they may walk forward boldly as the source of truth for their children, as the guides, as the leaders, as the sounding board, as the safe place that their children may come to have conversation about the challenging, hard, broken, often mm. ways of this world. Yes. And Father, I speak over the over the coming generation, over every yes, child of the parents listening, Lord. I just pray a, a shield of protection, Lord. Yes. I pray a shield of protection by the Holy Spirit that you would guard them and keep them, watch over them, um, and just no flaming arrow of the evil one would prosper. No weapon mm, formed yes. against them would stand. Yes. Lord, I their eyes, their minds, uh, their hearts, their ears to hear you, Lord, to desire and hunger and thirst for righteousness, mm. to walk in your ways, to listen to their parents. Oh, you say in the Proverbs, it's the, the, the godly have the wisdom to, to listen to their fathers, to heed their mother's words, God, to walk in truth. So I just pray an anointing over the children Jesus. of the parents listening, God, um, that they would be supernaturally drawn to righteousness, to walk in your ways. Yes. And that you would anoint them, Lord, to turn the tide, to be great reflectors of your love and your truth to a lost and hurting world, God, to be a light amongst their peers, to walk in purity, to walk in holiness, uh, to walk in intimacy with you, God, as mm. they grow and mature and as they carry uh, the kingdom work forward in the years to come. We love you. We trust you. We thank you for this time in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Mo. Um, you just shared so many gem nuggets with us today. And I'm so grateful for you coming on the show. Of course. Thank you for having me. It was a joy. And again, thank you for having the, the openness and the boldness to cultivate this conversation too. I, yes. I hope it blesses the mothers listening. Yes, me too. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Gems of Motherhood podcast. If you're wanting to connect with more amazing Gems of Mothers and more resources, head over to the gemsofmotherhood.com where you can subscribe to the show. That's where you'll find show notes and actionable tips of any links mentioned by our guests. Most importantly, I hope you'll find inspiration and learn to cultivate your own journey. You are loved. You're an incredible gem to God. He knows you intimately. He knows what you're going through and he knows what you need. Remember, you are fearfully and wonderfully made in him. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode.